So I lost my key fob or, or my key to the church building this week. Honestly, like no clue. Like I can't remember where I left it or where I might have dropped it. And like, it's not just that, like there's a bunch of stuff I can't remember. Like I can't remember my credit card number. Uh, every time I try to buy something, I have to have to dig it out and what, whatever that, what's that little code on there? I have to look that little thing up again every single time. Uh, it gets worse than that. I can't remember how old I am. And, and I'm super embarrassed and admit this next part. I honestly can't remember how old my kids are. Like, I seriously, like, I must be pretty old if I can't remember how old I am. Um, like, honestly, like, people ask, and I have to do the math in my head every single time. Like, there's so much, like, necessary information that I just can't seem to remember. But somehow, miraculously, I know every word to every single Garth Brooks song. Like, I do. And, and honestly, like, I don't even know how. I wouldn't even say that I'm a Garth Brooks fan. Uh, I don't have any of his songs on my playlist. I'm definitely not someone who knows the lyrics to songs. Just, I mean, honestly, you can just ask my wife. She knows I sing the wrong words almost constantly. But if I happen to hear a Garth Brooks song, even if it's been a decade since I last heard it, I can immediately start to sing along. Has this, has this ever happened to you? Like, how is it that things can get so deeply embedded in there that remembering them doesn't take any effort and you don't have to concentrate? It's not even an active, like, conscious process. You just remember or you just know and they come flooding out. You see, I think that's what happens in this first chapter of Paul's letters to the believers under the influence in Colossae. His writing, uh, he's writing them a greeting. He's thinking about the issues they're facing and, and praying for them and the struggles they're facing, and that's when it happens. Without even trying, something in his thoughts and prayers for the people of Colossae brings a song, brings a song to his lips, or maybe to his pen. Here's what he sings. It's in the book of Colossians, the letter of Colossians, in chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, here's what he says. He says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. It says he existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, the supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. You see, this hymn was probably a common hymn in the early church, and it's, it, it's, it's one of the, maybe the most beautiful hymns in, in Scripture, one of, definitely one of the most beautiful hymns in the New Testament, but it's also one of the most theologically dense hymns. And I know maybe this happens. Sometimes we get in church or whatever, like we're just kind of singing along, but we're not really thinking about the words, not really thinking about what we're singing. I don't want that to happen here. I want us to, to slow down for a minute and let's take a look at this song verse by verse. And let's try to consider what Paul is really trying to get across here. He begins in verse 15 by saying Christ is Christ is the visible invisible. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Christ is the, that word image is the icon. In Greek, it's the word icon of God. That means uh, Christ is the statue, the image, the likeness. Christ is the high definition 4K TV, perfect representation of God. Paul, like this is a pretty awesome statement. Paul says, 
If you want to not only see God, but if you want to understand what God is like, the invisible God, if you want to see the invisible God, you have only to look at Jesus. He says, you, you want to know what God loves or hates? Look at Jesus. You want to know what God values or how he operates? Look at Jesus. Want to know what pleases him and what he expects of us? Look at Jesus. Like, this is an amazing statement because he says, nothing about God is hidden or invisible. It's all out on the table. There's, there's honestly, there's not even any guesswork about God. All of who he is, all of what he wants can be seen in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the imago Dei, the image of God. But Paul doesn't stop there. Jesus isn't just a representation of God. Jesus is the manifestation of God. If you look in verse 19, I know we've got to fast forward a little bit to get there. In verse 19, he says, For God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. That word fullness means it, that it wasn't just a sketch or somehow like a portrait. It, uh, image wasn't enough. The fullness of God speaks of the completeness, the, the, the idea that nothing was left out. And that fullness of God lived in Christ or, or dwelled in him. It's actually where we get the title for our series. That word dwell means to be exactly home. He, he, he placed his permanent residence, and this word dwell is all throughout Paul's letter to the Colossians. The word dwell is, is, is not a temporary dwelling. God didn't somehow like rent out space in Jesus like some sort of Airbnb. No, God changed his address. Like, you want to know where God is? Where can we find God? Where is God? The real God of the universe moved into and made his permanent home in Christ Jesus. Man, this is a good song. In the next section, he talks about uh, creation. And I, and I love this part. In the next few verses, we're going to kind of talk about creation. In verse, uh, the second half of verse 15, it says that he existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. The Big Bang. That's how scientists today describe the, the force or the energy or the engine of creation. The Big Bang is, is what, what it was that got this whole thing going, or at least that's what scientists call it. You see, for the Greek and Jewish thinkers in the first century, they didn't, they didn't know anything about a big bang. But the engine and energy of creation was wisdom, or sometimes they would refer to it as the logos. Logos uh, in Greek means word, but it, but it, 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 it hints at this, in, this more than just word. It hints at law and structure and design and orientation. The logos or the word for Jewish and Greek thinkers was uh, was more like the laws of nature. You know, they could see the stars and their movement had a pattern. The Logos was that pattern. It was what put that pattern into place. The Logos was the, or this word was the physics of how the universe was formed and functioned. This word or Logos or wisdom uh, was how everything is held together and works. Now, for them, if you could somehow get your hands on this logos or this wisdom, you could gain the keys to, to the universe. You could unlock the mysteries of the universe. You could access God and secure potentially your own salvation. Now, this is really interesting. In John's gospel, at the very beginning, when John writes his story of Jesus, he begins with these words. It's, he says, Thinking about the Jewish and Greek ideas of Logos, he says, in the beginning was the Logos. All right, so like Jewish and Greek thinkers, they would have immediately gone, okay, yep, correct. This ordering force of everything that got everything going and held everything together. Yes, in the beginning was the Logos. 
And John goes on to say, and this logos gave life to everything that was created, which, yep, perfectly in line with Jewish and Greek thought about how the world was held together. But if you fast forward a little bit into John chapter 1, verse 14, just a few verses later, he takes that logos and he does something very different and unexpected. He says in verse 14, he said, so the logos or the word became human and made his home among us. You see, when Paul sings that Jesus was before creation and supreme, or maybe your version says the firstborn, he is asserting that Jesus Christ is the logos. Jesus Christ is the Big Bang. Jesus Christ is the engine and energy of creation itself. Are you with me? He goes on in verse 16 to say that, For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things that we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Now here we are again with that visible, invisible, things we can see and things we can't see again. The things we can see are the things of the earth, the world, and all of its wonders. And our world's filled like we live in a natural wonder. Just watch like Planet Earth with David Attenborough. Like uh, this, he created all of the things that we can see. Uh, he created the blue angels and the jet engines, but he also, Jesus made platypus, right? Like, so the things that we can see, not saying we understand them, but the things we can see, Jesus created them. But Paul's not really talking about the natural world here. He's talking about the supernatural world. He's not talking about his emphasis isn't on the things that we can see, although for sure Jesus created those. His emphasis is on the things we can't see. And honestly, like for Christian parents, we have a really tough job in front of us here. Um, because we have to try to explain to our kids what's real and what's not real, even though maybe we can't see them. So, like, have you ever had this conundrum? Like, how do you convince your kids that the boogeyman hiding in their closet at night isn't real, but the devil that tempted Jesus in the wilderness is real? Like, how do you convince the, your kids or explain to them that the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus aren't real? They're not real. Get over it. If you're watching this, you're old enough to know. But the angels that sang over the shepherds at Jesus' birth are real. You see, like the people of Colossae, like they didn't need convincing that a world or, or powers beyond our sight existed. They, they called them thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities or the boogeyman. You see, these invisible forces for them, for their, for their culture were like, it was just a constant threat. Um, they lived under a constant threat of these, of these fates, right? And to navigate and to appease and placate these forces, you needed some sort of special knowledge. And it's important to note, and maybe the church in the global north, I think the, the American church probably needs to remember this, that, that Paul never debunks or doubts or even, he doesn't really even call into question these supernatural unseen forces um, these rulers and authorities instead what Paul does is asserts Jesus authority over them if there is a boogeyman in your kid's closet Jesus can take him out doubt it go back and read the gospels again read the story of Jesus again and discover again that the forces of the known and the unknown, the forces of the seen and the unseen, the forces of the natural and the supernatural world all bow down to the authority of Jesus and are completely subservient to him. 
Paul goes on to say in verse 16 in this incredible song, he sings out that everything was created through Jesus and for him. All right, so we got the through him part already. Jesus is the energy and the engine of creation. Yeah, yeah, we, we got that part. But he adds a second part here that's really unique and so important for us to get. He says, not only was everything created through him, but everything in creation was created for him. So, okay, what does that mean? What does it mean for him? You know, I think sometimes it seems like things are spinning out of control. That it maybe it may does that feel like it to you? Like like with all the uncertainty that's out in our world right now, like sometimes it feels like we live in a world of randomness, that we live in a world of chaos, a world without purpose or intention. And I know maybe it seems that way, but I want you to look at this a little bit differently. Imagine for me just for imagine with me just for a second. Imagine in your head a carpenter or a fabricator or a craftsman of some kind, right? This craftsman is, sits down at his workbench and carefully plans out, designs a new tool, right? Draws it out, sketches it out, design for a new tool. And once the design work is done, that same craftsman begins the production process. He gets the materials, he begins to shape and form and forge and grind and mold all of these materials into this to design until finally sitting on his workbench is a finished, polished, new tool. Now imagine this craftsman who took all the time to design and create this new tool, looks down at the new tool, polished and finished, sitting on his workbench, and says to him, man, this tool is really random. I wish I knew what it was for. Like, is it possible to imagine someone creating a tool or creating something that doesn't have a purpose. Like they create something and then it's somehow at the end of the process, they look at it and go, man, I wonder what that's for. No, it makes no sense, right? Craftsmen and creators don't make things without a purpose or without a reason. And I think so we should ask like, okay, what's the message for you and I, the created? And there's some really important things here for you to consider. One is that you are no accident. That you are somehow, somehow, sometimes we get this idea in our head that like we're a mistake or we're, we're somehow invaluable. You are no accident. You, you are no mistake. You are uniquely created. And the fact that you are unique tells us that you weren't some random accident, but you were created with intention and purpose. And that purpose is to serve him, to serve the one who made you and created you. And you will never experience, I mean, I, I know our world, we are on the hunt for fulfillment and meaning. What's the meaning of life? Here's what I will tell you. You will never experience greater fulfillment than when you lean into your created purpose. And that, and that implies recognizing the one who created you and serving him and his mission for the world. I dare you, if you don't believe me, I dare you to try it. Begin to use your life to serve, and you will find meaning and purpose and fulfillment that nothing else in this world can offer. Let's keep going to verse 17 in this epic hymn. Paul sings in verse 17, man, a line that we, we definitely need to hold on to right now. It says that he, Jesus, existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Man, I, I think this is such an important reminder for us. What Paul says is that he has been with us from the start. From, from, he's been with us from before the start. 
And despite the chaos and fear and uncertainty we may be experiencing, he hasn't somehow lost his grip. He is still holding this thing together. Do you believe that? This final section, Paul shifts from talking about creation and his purpose to talking about the church and his purpose. And, and honestly, like, I feel like I'm running short on time. So I'm going to save some of that for next week, even though I'm super excited to share it with you. But I want to go back to something that Paul said in verse 15. In verse 15, just as we wrap up, Paul says that Jesus Christ is the, maybe your, your version says, firstborn over all creation. But I love what the New Living Translation, how, how it translates it. I think it translates it, it, it correctly. The New Living Translation says that, that Jesus Christ is the supreme, hold your arms up like that, supreme over all creation. I hear that word supreme, like firstborn uh, is, the, is right, but supreme is better because firstborn to us just implies this like, like birth order, but it means so much more than that. You see, when I hear the word supreme, I can't help but think about pizza. I was a youth minister for years, so that I, I think that makes me honestly an expert on pizza. I know what kind of pizza to order. I know what kind of crust you want. I know what kind of toppings are best. I have experienced it all. And by far, the best pizza is the Supreme. I even brought one. The Supreme Pizza has every ingredient on it. Are you with me? Are you, are you tracking here? It has it all. You got, you got your meats and your cheeses and different cheeses. You got your vegetables. It's all there together. It's lacking nothing. You see, the Supreme Pizza has everything you could hope for. It honestly satisfies every want or need, and nothing else comes close. And honestly, that's exactly what Paul is proclaiming in this hymn. He is saying and reminding and singing to the people of Colossae, Jesus is everything you could hope for. Jesus satisfies every want or need. And in Jesus, there's nothing left out or missing or somehow lacking. You can take every award, every prize, every record. You can take every championship, every hall of fame, every discovery, every advancement. You could take every accomplishment in athletics, in art, in industry, in academics. You can take the greatest achievements and aspirations of mankind, lump them all together, and you still can't come close because Jesus Christ is the first in everything. He's the embodiment of God himself. Jesus Christ is the GOAT. You guys know that acronym? Jesus Christ is the greatest of all time. Jesus Christ is supreme. But you know what would happen? As a youth minister with all of my years and wealth of pizza knowledge and experience, I would order pizzas for our youth group and we would have a dozen pizzas arrive and we'd set them out. And of course, there is the beautiful Supreme pizzas. Because I know that the Supreme is the best. I know the Supreme is the one that satisfies every desire. And inevitably, Someone of our youth group would come up to me wanting only cheese.
And the truth is, I, I think that some of you right now, like you're feeling overwhelmed and stressed and afraid. And, and, the, and that fear and that stress and that uncertainty, in, in that somehow you've missed or forgotten the fullness of who Jesus is and what he can do. All of this season of uncertainty has, has caused you to, to survive on and settle for something less. And some of you are surviving with, with all of the goodness of God and Jesus Christ available to us. Some of you are surviving on only cheese. And if that's you, like Paul, I just want to insert a embed in you a new song like your your heart needs a new song and no it's it's not a garth brooks song but i hope like it will become so deeply rooted in you that like paul it comes pouring out of you without even thought or effort in the face of every doubt in the face of every we, uh, fear or worry or uncertainty, I want you to have a new song, a song of the greatness and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Don't settle for the cheese. In Christ, we have all we need. Let me pray for you. Jesus, you are the highest. You are the greatest. You are the Lord of all. Angels will worship and nations will bow down. So in, in this city and in this county and in this country and in this world, let every heart, let every tongue sing of your name. Sing of your name. Amen. Man, I thank you guys so much for joining us again today. Uh, if, if somehow you've settled for a lesser song or a lesser version of Jesus, uh, man, uh, we'd love the opportunity to pray with you. And, and maybe you're ready to make Jesus Lord of your life and proclaim him Lord of your life. Man, uh, text us, email us. Like We would love to follow up with your response. If God's putting it on your heart to respond to this message, man, don't put it on the shelf. Reach out to us. We'd love to pray with you and follow up with you. I also maybe encourage you this week to write your own song of the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Man, it's a song our world desperately needs now. So sing of him this week. Sing of his greatness. Sing of the supremacy of Christ. And because today's teaching was all about the supremacy of Christ, and because I don't want you to settle for the cheese... Uh, I drew three random names uh, out of the directory here at Aspen Grove. Today, on Sunday, at 6 o'clock, I have ordered three Supreme Pizzas. And trust me, honestly, I really just randomly pick names out of our directory. So today, at 6 o'clock, Bob and Marilyn Brown, you are going to receive a Supreme Pizza for me. Carol Pere, you are going to receive a Supreme Pizza. And uh, Megan Crager, you are also going to receive a supreme pizza. And the message is for all of you, I would send all of you a supreme pizza. I really would. Don't settle for the cheese. Thank you again for joining us today. Man, let's uh, continue in our worship service together. May God, our Father, give you grace and peace.